Hi, I'm Glyn Dewis, and welcome to episode three of my video podcast. Okay, so in this episode, I thought I'd take you through the whole retouching process of one single picture. So that'll mean we can start off in Lightroom, do everything that I do in there before then taking it over into Photoshop for a bit more high-end kind of retouching and some finishing touches as well. So the picture we're gonna work on is this one here. This is a girl called Sam Smith, who's actually the World Boxing Union international champion. I was fortunate enough to be up in Halifax this past weekend photographing Sam with my buddy Kieran Neverson. So this is the final retouch picture. Now the out of camera shot was this one here. So it's, it's well exposed, we've used a light meter, uh, two lights, one coming in from the right hand side of the picture to mimic window light and then one just in front of Sam to camera right which is adding in just a little bit of light to fill in some of those shadows. But there's things I want to do now to, to start off the retouching process, and this is the kind of stuff that I would do on most pictures before taking into Photoshop. So in Lightroom then, the first thing I'm going to look at doing here is coming over to Develop Module and bringing up the blacks, because although this is well exposed, I actually want to reduce the contrast in this picture so I can control that later on exactly where I want the contrast to be. So I'm going to bring up the blacks, might bring up the shadows just a little bit as well, and I'll just drop down the highlights so they're not too strong. Something like that is good. I'll also crop this. I'm going to press R on my keyboard. Just bring down the composition just a little bit here, not so high up. Bring it in from the left, and I'll also bring it in from the right. Now, you can see there's just the, the edges of the light modifiers here which have crept into shot, and we'll have to remove those later on in Photoshop. So I'll just bring this up the floor just a little bit like so. So that's looking good. Um, need to darken down this floor as well, so I can use my gradient tool over here. So I'll click on the gradient, drag from the floor, and drag straight up. Now I can also click in the middle, move that down, so I don't want it to be too high, and then I'll just reduce the exposure just to control how much light spill is going onto that floor. Because like I said, this is supposed to look like a window light coming in from the right, but I didn't want too much spill coming in on the floor. So that gradient tool there is perfect for doing that kind of effect like so. Okay, the next thing I wanted to do, we had this really nice mural, this kind of artwork on the wall here, but because the light was skipping across it and the paint that had been used, it did kind of brighten up a little, so we lost a bit of the features. So I can now come over to my adjustment brush, and I'll just reduce the exposure on the slider there, just the exposure I'm going to use for now. And I'm going to click in the bottom left of my screen. We've got this Show Selected Mask Overlay. I'm going to put a little tick in there because that's going to help me to see exactly where it is that I'm painting. So now we can see with that red overlay, this is the area that I want to sort of darken down, reduce the highlights so we can see a little bit more of that detail. And once I've painted in it, I'll just take that tick out now so it's a bit easier to see exactly what I'm doing. So now then I'll reduce the exposure just a little bit more, but also the highlights because it's the highlights that were being created by that light skipping across. So something like that is looking good. Now one thing as well that I do in, in uh, Lightroom, I don't do a lot of blemish removal on skin, but there is a facility to do that using the healing brush. So I might just come in, let's just zoom in on Sam just a fraction. Let's just get rid of the uh, adjustment brush there. Let's just zoom in on Sam. Just a couple of blemishes here, just to show you that you can actually do this using the healing brush. So I'm gonna click on the healing brush, and I'll bring the size of my brush right down because I only want it to just be slightly bigger than the spot itself. So I'll paint on that little mark there and I can drag this around to choose an area that kind of covers it over just right. And we'll do another one just here. And we'll move that around just so it covers it. Something like that is fine. That's all we need to do there. Now this picture, as you remember from seeing the final retouch, is going to be quite a hard, gritty, detailed picture. So I'm going to add some sharpening at this point. Now if this was a, a normal female portrait, I wouldn't add a lot of sharpening because obviously that's going to make it a little bit too hard. But for this one we can afford to have a, little, a bit more than I would normally go for. So for this picture here, I'm going to take the sharpening way up to around about somewhere between 60 and 70. So let's go for 65 for argument's sake. I'll probably keep the radius at one. And the masking, what I'm gonna do now is now that I'm at 100% view, hold down my option key, click on the masking slider and drag to the right. So at the start, all of it's being sharpened. You can see here, everywhere that's white is being sharpened. Drag over to the right. And then anywhere that's white is what's being sharpened. Anywhere that's black is where the sharpening isn't being applied. So my main focus here is for Sam to be sharpened. And yeah, a little bit on that wall as well where we've got that nice painting. 
So something like that. And in fact, one thing I will do as well while we're here, let's go to the hue, saturation and luminance. Sc uh, Sam's skin tones may be a little bit orange, a little bit red. And I think that's probably a Nikon thing, to be honest with you. I tend to find that it does go a little bit warm in the, in the oranges and the reds. So I'm just going to bring down on the saturation tab here, just bring down the oranges as well. And obviously that's available to us in Camera Raw. So we ordinarily in Photoshop, we wouldn't have access to orange, but we can now. So let's bring down the oranges as well. And I might just knock down the saturation in this picture somewhere like that. So that's probably all I'm gonna do in Lightroom. Now we're gonna send it over into Photoshop to start adding some finishing touches, get rid of some areas that we don't want, and yeah, get it all uh, done and dusted. So let's head over into Photoshop. Okay, so now that we're in Photoshop, what I actually want to do is show you some of the techniques that I use to get to the final result. What I won't do is just have you sit in there for maybe an hour as I work my way through the picture. I thought it'd probably be best if I just show you in stages some of the things that I actually did to get to the final result. So first of all, the, one of the things I wanted to do was get rid of the soft boxes in the right and left hand side of my picture. So that was easy. It's a case of duplicating the background layer I then got my polygonal lasso tool for the one on the right because we had straight edges and I found that one an easy one to just make a very, very quick outline around it like so. And then just use the fill menu and use content aware from the drop down menu. And Photoshop does an amazing job actually removing the softbox just there as you can see. And for the one in the top right hand corner, I just used my freehand lasso tool, made a very, very rough outline around it. And again, use content aware from the drop down menu, from the fill drop down menu. Now, one thing I don't do as well at this stage, I didn't tend to keep these two layers because, well, what's the point? You know, Photoshop has done a great job removing it. I'm never going to want to tweak what it's done, so I tend to just flatten it at this stage. So the next thing I tended to do at the, from this point onwards is I add in the details. Now, there's lots of ways you can add in details in the picture, and one of the techniques that, or actually one of the plugins I like to use now is called Topaz Detail 3. I absolutely love this, this plugin. It gives you great, great details and an effect that's quite hard to replicate within Photoshop. Although there are techniques you can use to get a similar effect, okay? You're not gonna get exactly the same, but you can get a similar effect. So I'll just show you very, very quickly a way that you can get it within Photoshop itself if you don't have the Topaz Detail plugin. And I'll go through this bit here quite quickly, but because again, you know, we're using video, you can stop, you can rewind, and you can play it again until you see all the, all the sort of steps that you uh, want to so that you can make notes and remember it for later. So here we go. First thing you can do is create two copies of the background layer, and those two copies get put into their own group. So new group from layers, and we'll call it details. And click OK. Once you've done that, change the blend mode of that group there to overlay, and then open the group up and change the blend mode of the one in the uppermost part of the group to vivid, vivid light, vivid, vivid light even, and then go to image adjustments and invert. And then it looks like you've actually done nothing. But if we zoom right in here and we go to the filter menu, choose blur and surface blur, this is where you can use the radius and threshold sliders, which are best to keep around about the same each. So I tend to, if I do ever use this technique, Let's say if I'm going to use radius of 20, I'll make sure the threshold is 20 as well. Keeps things nice and uniform so I know exactly what it is I'm doing. So we'll keep both at 20. And you can see now if I turn that on and off, you can see on your screen there, that does have quite a good effect there for bringing in details. It's not identical to Topaz details, but it is a really, really good alternative. But let's just uh, delete that there. And then what I tend to, I'll show you now what I tended to do. Um, I use... Uh, smart filters because it's a smart way of working which you've just seen in previous episodes so I'll convert this to a smart filter and once I've done that I'll then dive over into Topaz Detail from the filter menu here Topaz Detail 3 let's just jump over into Topaz Detail and Topaz just bringing it in now and once it's brought it in I'll be able to show you the kind effect that this actually has so here's our picture and what I'm going to do now is to zoom in just so you can see a bit more clear on screen here. And let's just drag it over to the right hand side. And all I tend to do here is on the, on the right hand side of the screen, we've got the detail slider. I'm only looking to increase the small details with maybe a little bit of medium details. So they're the only sliders that I tend to use. I'll drag those over to the right. Small details over to the right, but not quite so much. Medium details, again over to the right, but not quite so much as the other one. So that I get this kind of arc going up here. If you can see my cursor here, everything at the bottom stays the same, and then it kind of arcs off to the right hand side. Now if I hold down my space bar, you can see on and off, you can see the effect that's having. So it adds in a real nice amount of detail. And I tend to just click OK now. 
once I brought this picture out, what I don't want to do is apply the effect to the whole picture um, because I don't want this skin to have quite so much detail as what it's got. So all I'll do now then, I'll just click on the lay mask here. I get a brush and for Sam, I'll probably remove about 50% of the effect. So a brush, a black brush, a 50% opacity and I'll just paint that away over, oh sorry, off her skin there. So I'll just quickly jump forward with the video just to remove that and then we'll carry on and show the next part which is how I go about doing dodging and burning. Okay, so I've just removed all that uh, detail, I'll say all of it, 50% of it off Sam's skin so the skin doesn't look quite so grungy. And the next thing I'll do is just quickly show you how I do dodging and burning. Now, what I tend to do with that is I tend to use a blank layer and I fill that with 50% grey. So from the drop down menu, 50% grey. And when I'm dodging and burning on skin, I use the blend mode soft light because it adds a nice controllable amount of dodging and burning. Whereas if I used overlay, it's just a little bit too powerful, but overlay is really great for everything other than skin. So clothing, machinery, walls, you name it, overlay works a treat. But for dodging and burning then, so I'm now using this 50% grey layer on the skin set to soft light. I'm gonna get my uh, dodge tool over here in the toolbar, dodge tool, and exposure for me generally set around about no more than 10%. Now, if you can see, probably see on the screen here, I've got it set to 20, but that's purely so you can actually see the effect on your screen. Uh, range is set to mid-tones, and I've got protect tones ticked as well. And what I'll do now is I'll tend to use the dodge tool to add in highlights. So let's say I wanted to add a bit of a highlight into a forehead there, and I'll do a highlight going down her nose as well, somewhere like so. I might brighten the middle of the eyes up a little bit. And then when I want to use the burn tool, rather than coming over and changing to the burn tool, what I can do is just hold down my option key. Now that'll then switch to the opposite tool. So if I'm using the dodge tool, it then becomes the burn tool. If I'm using the burn tool, it becomes the dodge tool. Now you'll see no change at the top of the screen, but when you start using it, keeping that option key held down, you will notice that you're starting to do some burning. So if I just go over her eyebrow here, I'm holding down my option key, going over the eyebrow, and just paint it in like so. So if I just turn this on and off, you can see the effect that's happening, having even. So I've got a highlights added in, got some shadows added in as well. And that's generally what I tend to do now. I'll tend to work around the picture, painting with a small amount, because it's best to start off with a small amount and then build up, adding in highlights and shadows to really start to shape the picture. So like for example, on her neck here, I've got to paint down that highlight on a bit of a neck and then put a bit of a burn either side of it as well. So it really makes it kind of stand out. So everywhere there's a shadow, or sorry, wherever there's a highlight, either side of it, I'll just paint a shadow in as well. So like so. And again, I'll just work my way around this picture, do a little bit of dodging and burning. So the next time we come back to it, you'll see the kind of results that got, that's got. But let's just go from here, just show you a quick photography tip that I recorded when I was up in Halifax. Hi folks, Glyn Jewis here. Uh, we're here up in Halifax today, taking pictures with the Halifax Rugby League team. Okay, these guys over here. Uh, just taking some stage shots with the lights that you can see around here. I thought while we're here, it'd be a good chance to sort of show just a very, very quick tip about photographing people when they're moving. So here is generally what I do. Now I'm using my D800 here. I've got the manual, sorry, the autofocus is on. And what I'm gonna do is we've got our lights all set up. So if I just bring you in for a second, when we've got our guys sort of stood here now, the lights are all set to make ex perfect exposure in this position here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a piece of dirt and I'm gonna put it right by his foot. Okay, so that's quite important part. So what I'm gonna do now then, I'm gonna get my uh, focus right. So I'm focusing on my chap here. Once the focus is locked, I'm then gonna turn off autofocus. So now the focus is locked at that particular point. And all I'm going to do now is, when our rugby guy goes back, when he comes in towards the camera, I'm only looking at that bit of dirt on the floor. As soon as his foot hits that bit of dirt, that's when I press my shutter. So let's give that a go. So you go back. Okay, so all I'm doing is looking at that dirt, and when I see his foot land on it, that's when I take my shot. So one, two, three, go. And bang, there we go. Actually, that's the better one. <laughs> that's the better one I've done all day. <laughs> but there you go, to see... Um, so that's it, just a really, really quick tip. Put something on the floor and that's all you're focusing on. So you get your guy, you get him into position, focus on him, lock your focus. He goes away and when he comes running in, all you're looking at is that little bit of whatever you've put on the floor. As soon as his foot lands on it, press your shutter, everything's in shot. Quick tip, 
back to me in the studio. Okay, so I've gone around and done a fair bit more dodging and burning, and I'll just turn that layer on and off now so you can see the kind of effect that that gives us. Now, dodging and burning is one of those areas that you can get really, really carried away, and I tended to do that quite a bit when I first started because it is so addictive. But the only thing is, because you enjoy doing it and you do more and more and more, before you know it, you've done way too much and gone overboard. So if I was going to give any advice about dodging and burning, it would be to do it in stages. Do 10 or 15 minutes maximum. Then go away from the screen, grab yourself a tea or a coffee, come back, and then you're going to look at your picture with fresh eyes, and you'll know straight away whether or not you need to do more or you need to do less. So that's just one real sound bit of advice that I learned from when I first started doing all this kind of stuff. But the great thing about actually doing dodging and burning on a grey layer as opposed to directly on your image is the flexibility it gives you, because we're always looking to... Give ourselves flexibility when we're doing our retouching here in case we make mistakes or we need to alter something. So now then, if I'm using my grey layer, if I wanted to help an area to blend in just a little bit more, I can just come in with my lasso tool and make a selection of it. Something like here, and maybe this bit on her neck. And I can just add some blur just to soften it down so those highlights and shadows I painted in tend to blend in much more realistically with each other when I blur it so that eventually the final result just looks a little bit more pleasing and not so obvious. So that's the dodging and burning there. Now the next thing I want to do is add some clarity because this picture is going to really be quite a punchy, detailed picture and clarity is perfect for this. Now I'm going to be using the uh, Camera Raw now to use the clarity slider within Camera Raw and I absolutely love that. And obviously we can do that using the new Photoshop CC with the Creative Cloud. But you know, there's also another way that I add clarity and it's by my one of my favorite plugins again uh, by a company called Topaz and it's called Topaz Clarity, funnily enough. Now, some people say to me, why would you have a Topaz Clarity plugin when you've already got to um, clarity built into Camera Raw? Well, the simple answer is that the effect that each of them gives is unique. You know, what works on one picture doesn't work on another. And I'm tending to find that that's definitely the case with the new Topaz Clarity plugin. I actually think when I did this um, picture here for real, the final picture that you've already seen, I think I did use the Topaz Clarity plugin at some stage, but maybe not at this point, because you'll see at the end, there's a part I get to that I call playtime. And that's when I just start doing all kinds of crazy things to get the final finished picture that I want. And it's just experimenting at that stage. And I used the Topaz Clarity then, and it worked a treat. But let me just show you now how I'm going to head over into clarity within Camera Raw and do it in a way that's going to give me flexibility and in a way that I can make changes later on if I need to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put both of these layers here into a smart object so that if I want to, later on, I can come back and change the dodging and burning. Because now if I created a merged layer and then gone into Camera Raw, I'm then stuck. I can't go back and make changes to the dodging and burning without having to undo quite a bit of work already. So now I've got a smart object. I'm going to head over into Camera Raw. And this is a grungy picture. So I'm going to really add quite a bit of clarity in here. So let's just zoom in to around about there is fine. Clarity slider and whack it right over to the right hand side. And I'm going to go to around about 70, something like that. And if I turn it on and off, you can see that that effect that has just there. I love that just like that and click OK and come back into Photoshop. So that's my clarity that's been added in. So it's really starting to add some punch into it. But one thing I don't like at the moment is how saturated the colors are. I'm a big fan of desaturated colors. So I tend to use a black and white conversion at this stage and just back it off a little bit so that some of the color shows through. I'm a big fan of desaturated colors, I really am. Um, now there's lots of ways that I tend to do black and white conversions. I'm a big fan of the Nick Silver FX Pro 2. Um, Topaz have a plugin as well called Topaz Black and White, but there's also you know so many options that we've got of ways of doing this within Photoshop itself. So for this one, I'm just going to use a straightforward black and white adjustment. I don't need to do too much to it. All I am going to do is just lower the opacity, so some of the color starts to show through. And I'll probably leave it around about 50, something like that. And this is actually why I, ch I asked Sam to use a red boxing glove. So it does give us a bit of a focal point and a bit of more interest into the picture. All right, so now what I want to do is just kind of 
shape the light a little bit more in this pitch. And the way that I did that in this one was by using the radial filter within uh, Camera Raw because that allows us to make a really, really nice vignette. Obviously, there's lots of ways we can do vignettes, but I'm really liking using the radial filter. So as before, we're going to work non-destructively. So I'm going to put these two layers here into a smart object so that I can then head over into Camera Raw, apply my vignette using the radial filter, but then later on in the retouching, if I want to change it, all I need to do is just double click on it, go back into Camera Raw and make some changes. So we'll go to Filter, Camera Raw, I'll then dive straight in to use the radial filter, click in the middle like so. And I don't want the vignette to be even around the edges here. I'm going to click in the middle and drag it to the right hand side so the lights focus more on Sam and I can then darken down the left hand side a lot more of the picture using the exposure slider here. Now you'll notice at the bottom right hand corner of the picture this got just a little bit too dark because of that vignette but the great thing is I can then head over back into Photoshop and because I've used it as a smart object I get a mask I can then get a brush and I can paint away just a little bit of about that vignetting in the bottom corner here now, just with my brush, just to paint in just a little bit of that more light and then shape it in just a little bit like so. So I think at this stage here, this is where I kind of got to the point where the picture was 99% of the way finished and I saved it, then walked away. Uh, I think the next morning is when I actually carried on retouching, but that was then only kind of playtime. That was when I started adding in the cartoon effect. I used Topaz Clarity to give it a little bit more punch and just a few of the little tweaks to be honest with you. But it's not until the next day that I've really wanted to do that because Otherwise, if I'd have left it on the first day when I'd done all the research into this stage, it wasn't really ready. I was thinking, what else can I do to this picture? It's not until I go away for some considerable time, then come back and I know straight away if I need to do something or if I don't need to do something. But for now, let's have a quick look to see where we've actually come from. Here is the image that we came from Lightroom with, having reduced the contrast, darkened down the floor, improved the exposure on that back wall because we we're losing some of the detail in that original painting. We went from Lightroom at this stage to then here within a relatively short space of time to end up with a picture at this stage here. And looking at things overall, here we are in Lightroom. On the left hand side, you can see the original out of camera shot to then my final finished retouch picture on the right hand side. Okay, folks, thanks for tuning in to this particular episode. And as always, if there's any questions or comments you've got, by all means, drop me a line to glynn at glynnjewish.com or leave a comment in the comments section below. And as always, if there's any tips, tricks, or techniques that you'd like to see in future episodes, again, just give me a shout and I'll see what I can do. In the meantime, if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you tick the subscribe button, which is somewhere up here, I think, on YouTube. And feel free to share this with anybody else that you think might benefit from the photography side of it, the Photoshop or the Lightroom. Right, that's all for now. I shall see you next week for episode four.